I'm home caught, you standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? I'm home caught, you standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? They ain't believing me in the beginning. Who wanna hang around now they see me winning? I'm home caught, you standing trial. Why ain't I see you round back when I was down? What's up, world? It's your boy, Big Court, from the Holding Court Podcast. Today's episode is sponsored by Uncle P's Pancake and Waffle Mix. It's available in all grocery stores nationwide. This is Black-owned. This is ours. Product outweighs talent every day. So remember, there's no limit to your success. Uncle P's Pancake Mix, available right now. What's up, world? It's your boy, Big Court. I'm here on the Holding Court Podcast, and I'm here with my co-producer, Producer Ken. What's cracking, bro? Man, it's chilling, chilling. All right, all right. And today, we have a very special guest, uh, producer of the series Unsolved on USA involving uh, Tupac murder. Yep. Yeah, and, and also Murder Rap, which uh, explores Biggie and Tupac uh, murders as well, uh, Mr. Mike Dorsey. Hi. Hey, how you doing, brother? Thanks for having me. Yeah, Good. yeah. Thanks for coming, man. You, uh, you, you produce some very compelling content. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, before we get off into the the work you've done concerning Tupac and Biggie, um, I just kind of want to touch bases on your upbringing a little bit. Sure. I mean, did you grow up, uh, you know, listening to hip hop? Not really. I, I grew up in North Orange County, mm-hmm. and you know, rock was more more my thing. Rock, alternative, mm-hmm. Nirvana. REM. Okay. Pearl Jam. Okay. You know, um, so I like hip hop, like but I, right? yeah, I like hip hop, but I'm not like a hip hop head. I don't mm-hmm. claim to be like a, you know, a super mm-hmm. fan. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah. Okay. So you grew up in, you said OC? Yeah. I grew up in Fullerton. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You used to live in Fullerton, right? Uh, briefly. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I, remember that. yeah. I lived right on the border of Fullerton and Brea. Yep, yeah. That's where I lived. Associated Road. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Associated <laughs> Road, exactly. Yeah, was, that's I funny. There. I was there for a little bit. Mm. My sister went to college out there. So. I remember coming down there thinking it was far as shit. It is far. <laughs> it is far. <laughs> I mean, I'm not from LA, so I've, bound, mm-hmm. I've been all over LA. So yeah, and Orange County. So you say, um, so you grew up in OC, but um, you said we were talking, um, you know, prior prior to getting on a uh, camera. You say your dad was from Compton. Yeah, my dad uh, was born in Los Angeles, and when he was like a toddler, uh, my grandpa built a house in Compton Mm -hmm. near Alondra and Long Beach Boulevard. Okay. um, What later became Kelly Park Crip territory, right on right on the border, coincidentally with Southside Crip neighborhood. But he was there, you know, a decade or so before Mm -hmm. that all started. Okay. Okay. Did were you born yet? No, I was uh, no, I was born in in, in Inland Empire in the seventies. Oh, okay, okay, I see. So, um, so your your dad had roots in Compton, right? And ironically, years later, you would start doing work and investigate and do investigative work that would lead you right back to Compton. Exactly, it's very very (laughs) strange. In fact, when we filmed Murder Rap, we went down and filmed kind of around the Southside Crip neighborhood, and I swung by and looked at my dad's old house Uh just to see it because I had never seen it before. Wow. But um, you had never been to Compton uh, previous to that. I don't think so. I don't Mm -hmm. think I had. No, I mean maybe just passing through. But, mm-hmm. you know, if you, you go to Compton because you're going to Compton. There's right. no, you don't really pass through it right. go anywhere else, you know. So, <laughs> right. um, but I grew up hearing stories about Compton. It was always a rough place. Yeah. You know, yeah. my dad got into lots of fights. Mm-hmm. He talked about passing knives and chains back and forth behind class. Mm-hmm. And he was always getting into fights with people. And, mm-hmm. you know, the only difference then was it wasn't really guns. It was just, mm-hmm. you know, it was your fist. You had to be good with your hands. And then in Compton, you had what they call white flight, right. which took place with your 70s, early 70s, late 60s. Yeah, they left around 1960, right when mm-hmm. he was about to start high school. Okay. Uh, they found out he was going to have to go to, to Compton High, and mm-hmm. that was kind of the, the final, like, no. Really? Yeah, he, he's going he's gonna to get, he's fighting too much. Had the violence kind of um, started in Compton at that point? In yeah. terms of, I, I don't know the gangs were necessarily prevalent, but. It wasn't a gang thing, but it was always a blue collar, kind of rough and tumble type of town. So, mm-hmm. you know. It didn't really matter uh, what your background was. Mm-hmm. If you were there, you you know, mm-hmm. it was okay. always rough. Yeah. So um, being that you were into rock and, you know, different uh, other than hip hop genres sure. of music, um, what what 
gr- made you gravitate toward, you know, even caring about sure. the Tupac Biggie thing? Yeah, when I first moved to L.A. in 2002, so just, you know, about five years after Biggie's murder, I lived just a few blocks away from Fairfax and Wilshire where it happened. Mm-hmm. And I knew, because I'm a big uh, fan of entertainment history and Hollywood history, mm-hmm. I knew that's the intersection where it happened. Mm-hmm. And that kind of started it. And then um, in 2012, I came across an article on Greg Kading's Murder Rap book. Mm-hmm. And I, I had already done some true crime projects before that, and I was looking for my next one. Mm-hmm. And I read this article on his book, and it sounded credible. It mm-hmm. sounded legit. It didn't sound like crazy, you know, conspiracy stuff. Right. Uh, and I reached out to Greg, and he sent me the book and was like, read it, and if you still want to do it, let's mm-hmm. do it. And it, that's how it happened. But he had all the case files. Mm-hmm. He had, of course, you know, Keefe D's famous confession on tape. Right. He had all that. So if you're a documentary filmmaker, you know, and you have an opportunity to dig into all that, mm-hmm. like, you take it. What were your thoughts about the the murders, you know, 20 years, 20 plus years prior? Like sure. when, when Tupac got killed and Biggie got killed, what did you, on the outside looking in at that point, sure. what did you think? I remember uh, my roommate in college, because I was a freshman when that happened, when Tupac mm-hmm. was killed. And my roommate was super into hip hop. Mm-hmm. And I remember kind of feeling it through through him, I think. He was super depressed mm-hmm. about it. And just and then, you know, a few months later, mm-hmm. it's Biggie. Mm-hmm. So I, I was more more through uh, friends that I had in college that were into it is mm-hmm. kind of more how I related to what had happened. Right. Yeah. Did you have any thoughts on it, you know, in terms of or did you just not even think about it? You know, even vicariously through your friends. Like, did you think that, oh, man, yeah, to Suge must have did oh. this. Or, you know. <laughs> no, I had no, I didn't know anything about the mm-hmm. scene. Like, I didn't know who Tupac's friends were. You know, I didn't know anything about that. So. OK, so you didn't know none of the At the characters. time it happened. No. Yeah. No, oh. outside of you know Biggie and Tupac, I really in Puffy obviously mm-hmm. and Suge, I knew about them, but you don't. Re- I didn't know all their inner per- personal relationship mm-hmm. between anybody at that mm-hmm. time. Now, had you done? I was any... busy doing college stuff. Had you done? <laughs> did you major in film? No, I business school. Oh wow! Okay, yeah. <laughs> I've never taken a film class in my life. Really? Completely self-taught. Yeah. Okay, so what led you to doing? Had you done any investigative type uh, journalism or projects uh, around that time? Uh, well, not in college, but after I got out of college, I started looking, started doing film independently mm-hmm. and I moved out to LA and I just kind of fell into documentaries mm-hmm. and I always liked crime related stuff, I guess, cause my dad had been a sheriff's deputy mm-hmm. and my mom was a, a, a 911 operator and later on a, a paralegal. So I just kind of grew up around the law. Mm-hmm. So I was always, I, I grew up hearing stories, you know, okay. legal stories. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I was always fascinated by it. And then, um, and then uh, I made a documentary called The Six Degrees of Helter Skelter about the Manson murders. And that was mm. my first documentary. And that was my first foray into uh, true crime in L.A., especially L.A.-based wow, crime, wow. which was, yeah. you know, and there's a Hollywood aspect to that, too, you know, entertainment yeah. aspect to that whole crime, of course, with mm. Sharon Tate yeah. and the Sunset Music scene in the 60s. So, yeah. Yeah. so when you do those type of uh, projects, do you do your own research or do you take just bits and pieces of what's already out there and then put it together? I do. I, well, actually, I rely on experts. You know, when mm-hmm. I did the six degrees of Helter Skelter, um, I made friends with a guy who was already one of the leading experts on the Manson murders. Mm-hmm. So it gives you a nice launching off point to have an expert th- to work with. And then, of course, I do my own research on top of that mm-hmm. and verify what they're saying. But it was similar to when I started working with Greg, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and then, of course, he was totally open. He, here's all the case files. Mm-hmm. Here's, you know, 3,000 plus PDFs. Mm-hmm. And and I was free to look through them, at, you know, as I as I wanted. So I would do my own research, and I would go to I'd find something, I'd go ask him about it, mm-hmm. or I'd go look in somewhere else, and mm-hmm. you know, and I, I never took anything he took for granted, or or t- just took his word for it. Mm-hmm. And I was just talking to him the other day about this. I, mm-hmm. I was like, even you know, we've gotten to be you know pretty good friends over the years, and I said I still never take your word for it. Though, do I always ask? Fact check him. Yeah. I send. Hey, it was, yeah. Does that doc send that document to me? Let me read it because if I'm going to represent it to, to people, yeah. I want to be able to say I saw it with my own eyes. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. No, that's that's responsible journalism. Right. Um. So when you when you were doing the um, the helter skelter thing uh, with Charlie Manson. Did you find out stuff that you didn't know or that that wasn't common knowledge that had been previously reported like once you start peeling back the layers? Yeah, man, so much has been done on that case. It's mm-hmm. kind of similar to this. There's mm-hmm. a, not a many stones that haven't been turned mm-hmm. over with that case. Mm-hmm. And there's people that have focused on minute aspects of that story mm-hmm. that are they just there's always somebody that knows more about a part of that story than, you know, mm-hmm. Um but we um, did we turn over anything new? I don't know so much as we presented it to get people in a in a one package in one place where it mm-hmm. hadn't been presented before. Mm-hmm. And we focused a lot on locations where things had happened. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So, okay. Yeah. You know, I'm curious. Refresh me because sure. I, I was because that happened in the '60s, right? Yeah. Okay. What precipitated that whole crime? I mean, it was what? What was, it was that? Crazy. It was crazy. So Manson uh, had a hippie, you know, uh-huh. a commune, basically a hippie cult. Right. Uh, he was up in um, he was up at Spawn Ranch, kind of in the Chatsworth area, mm-hmm. and. He basically was doing a lot of drugs and had a lot of girls around. And he was a career criminal. He'd mm-hmm. been in and out of the system since he was a, a, a youth, mm-hmm. you know, a juvenile. And he was, you know, dealing drugs and running girls. And, you know, he, that's just who he was. He was a manipulative person. Mm-hmm. But he wanted to be a rock star. Mm-hmm. And he made friends with Dennis Wilson, the drummer for the Beach Boys, mm-hmm. and ended up kind of crashing at his house uninvited for a period of time. And the Beach Boys are trying to get him out. And Dennis Wilson thinks he's actually a decent musician. So Dennis Wilson takes him up to this Yellow Drive house where the murders ended up happening. But at the time, uh, a guy named Terry Melcher, who was Doris Day's son, is a big music producer. He was living there with his girlfriend, Candace Bergen, the actress. Mm. And so that's how that, that, that address got into his oh, mind. He starts going up there to, okay. to play music for Terry Melcher, hoping uh, to get a record deal. Okay. And Terry's kind of like, uh, <laughs> here's 50 bucks, like, mm-hmm. you know, good luck to you. Well, Manson interpreted that as a down payment on a record deal. Ah, uh, see all this time I thought that it was random. It was sort of he, was. Yeah. So then he goes up there, months go by, Terry Melcher moves out of the house, mm-hmm. Polanski and Sharon Tate move in, and Manson doesn't know that. So he goes up there one day looking for Terry oh, Melcher wow. again and he gets told they don't live here anymore. And he supposedly claims that when he went back to Spawn Ranch after that he said that they treated him like dirt. Mm-hmm. That he didn't they didn't show him their proper respect. Mm-hmm. And so what actually sparked the murders, I think, was um, they went uh, to try and rob a, mu- uh, a musician in um, Topanga Canyon who they heard had done like a drug deal or had money or inherited money. Mm-hmm. Or maybe there had been a drug deal gone wrong. It was something like that. But he didn't have the money. Mm-hmm. So they held him captive for several days and then they ended up murdering him. Mm-hmm. And a few days later, Bobby Beausoleil, who was right, Tarly's right-hand man, he was a, a really good musician, he got arrested and charged with the murder. Mm. So the theory is, one of the theories is that Manson freaked out about that and wanted Bobby out. So he decided to stage some more murders to look like the murder of this music got, this music teacher so they would think they had the wrong guy. Oh, wow. And so okay. he, and so basically he got, you know, Tex Watson and the girls high on LSD one night and said, go up to the house where Terry Melcher used to live mm-hmm. and kill everybody in it. And kill everybody all the way down the street, and mm. and you know make it make it look witchy is the mm-hmm. term he used. Squish their eyeballs on the walls, put blood mm-hmm. on the walls, you know make it look really terrible. And that's luckily they didn't attack any other houses, but right. they slaughtered everybody in in that house. And they did some pretty horrific shit. Yeah, it was awful. Yeah. And and Sharon Tate was pregnant at the time, right? She was eight months pregnant. Wow. Yep. In fact, if if they if they had gotten her medical attention, there's a chance that the baby would have lived. Mm-hmm. They could have you know cut it out of you know her womb, but. Yeah, that's how close she was to. Wow. She had come back from London because she was close to giving birth, mm-hmm. and you know, at a certain point, they don't let you fly anymore. So, mm-hmm. and then there was the La Bianca murders right, too. Following night. Yeah. So the following night, they that was completely random. Mm-hmm. He had partied at the house next door a few times, mm-hmm. but he's like, "Oh, I can't go there because they can link that to me." So I'll go, I'll go one house over and just kill this random middle-aged couple, and that's what he did. Wow. Charlie went in, tied him up, came out. Said, you know, go in and finish it off. He never did the dirty work. He himself. had those 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 women do it. He had the women and Tex Watson do it. Wow. Yep. Now one of them, uh, I think, is about to get paroled or some or did. Or uh, something like Bruce Davis recently. He was one of the guys. He it always gets shot down. The governor because mm-hmm. parole, which I don't think it should be, but parole is up to the governor at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. Parole board can recommend it, but the governor gets final say. And mm-hmm. what govern what politician? especially a guy who's facing a recall mm-hmm. effort, mm-hmm. is yeah. going to be like, oh, I'm going to let the Manson family out. You right. Know? So I personally believe some of them have, have done their time. They've mm-hmm. been in prison for 50-some years. Yeah. There's others I don't think should ever be let out for sure. Right. But there's a couple kind of side characters that I think are mainly still being held because yeah, of they're tied the Manson connection, yeah, the, the brand. The, the political, uh, political exactly. part of it. Yep. Okay, so you do that project. And so that was your first investigative type pro- project. Right. What, where, you, where was that released? That was uh, released by a company called Echo Bridge, and it was everywhere, man. It was in the $6 bin at Walmart for like a decade. <laughs> it was everywhere. It was so many places. It was at like Best Buy. It was on Amazon. You know, all the usual yeah. spots. So it did well. Mm-hmm. Okay. It, probably the most successful, uh, you know, as far as selling units, probably the most successful film I ever made. It's the first one I ever did, just because the Manson thing is always, mm-hmm. it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And Manson's dead, by the way, right? Yeah. Okay. He just died. He died. Okay. Yeah, he died a couple years ago. I think. Okay. Okay. But, um, so then after you do the, the Manson project, 
what's what's your next project after that? So I made a, a World War II doc about my grandfather and Buchenwald, the concentration camp, mm-hmm. um, which also had obviously somewhat of a crime aspect to it. There was an investigative aspect. Mm-hmm. Um, it was about uh, Allied airmen who were shot down, hid with the French resistance, were trying to get back to their bases, got betrayed by a double agent, turned over to the Gestapo, and s- instead of being sent to a POW camp, were sent to a concentration camp where they were supposed to be executed mm-hmm. as terrorists. And it's all about how they fought to survive and mm-hmm. and get out. So that was my next big mm-hmm. project. And you put that out? Yeah. Where uh, that out? came out through, well, it was a military channel in the U.S. Mm-hmm. picked it up, mm-hmm. and then it went all over. It was uh, networks in the U.K. and Germany and Australia and New Zealand, and, yeah, it went everywhere. Okay. So you kind of have an eclectic uh, background You've you know, right. in terms of investigative scenarios and situations crime hollywood and war like my three Uh areas of like interest i would say okay and so what so what ultimately would lead you because this is because you started murder rap what some 20 years later yeah i started well i started murder rap in around 2013 okay okay yeah yeah so now lee had you done uh, that's what you did. You did a bunch of projects leading up to uh, Murder App. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I always had a full time job in the business. Okay. You know, and then okay. I would make documentaries on the side. Ah. Okay. So it was like it's almost like I and I self fund all of them. So mm-hmm. it was almost like I had a real job so that I could <laughs> yeah. fund my documentary making. You know. So what piqued your interest? Not being a hip hop guy mm-hmm. and not even being in the know of these two situations. What piqued your interest to say, you know what? I want to really find out what's going yeah. on and showcase that to uh, the world. A good story is a good story. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter the mm-hmm. backgrounds of the character. And this is like Shakespearean level mm-hmm. drama. Yeah. Um, and also just how, uh, all the competing theories around it mm-hmm. and, um, and just the, uh, the idea that I would be able to, um, look at this case harder than anybody outside of law enforcement had ever looked at it. Mm-hmm. That was like, I couldn't pass that up. Mm-hmm. Why did you um, feel like you had more leverage to look at it more than law enforcement? Well, I would say more, more than people outside of law enforcement. Yeah. Um, because I had, I got the case files okay. and those are things that, you know, you can't get. Even if right. you do like a FOIA request, they're yeah. not going to just give you all the unredacted, you know, uh-huh. documents and stuff like that. So. Oh, so you got unredacted stuff. Exactly. Oh, damn. You yeah. got all the secrets, all the dirt. Yeah. yeah. Taped yeah. interviews, all of it. Yeah. Um, but I'm also, I'm very, I'm very responsible mm-hmm. with that. And you know, if you watch the stuff I put out, I always censor names and stuff. And I'm yeah. sure I don't, if it's a name on a document that I know has never had any connection to this case mm-hmm. in any other way, except that one thing they just mm-hmm. randomly got mentioned, I don't put that out there because I don't want to put people, Exactly. You know, they don't want to bring exactly. that to them, you know. Did you ever feel any looming danger being involved with any of this? Absolutely. Really? Yeah. When uh, Murder Rap came out, I moved mm-hmm. into a, like a more secure building because I didn't know what their action was going to be. Mm-hmm. And I knew, you know, some powerful people were going to not like it. Mm-hmm. So, but I, I never had any issues. We got a, one big legal threat was the only thing we ever got. Oh, okay. Things. So you never got any like street nope. pressure or anything like nope, that? Nope, nope, nope. No bullets on my doorstep or anything okay. like that. No, no, no warnings. <laughs> Would you had a steel pursued it if it had a went there? If you had a got those threats or felt? Yeah, I'm, I'm stubborn. I, I'm stubborn. It would have made me want to do it more, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. That's just how I am. What was your motivation for getting it? Was it just to tell the truth or just your artistic expression of Both. a good story? Good story and let's get to the truth. Mm-hmm. Where, wherever, you know, like Unsolved says, wherever it leads. Okay. Yeah. So truth. So Tupac, in this situation, Tupac gets killed first. Mm-hmm. We've had conspiracies. Um, we pretty much know what happened, but when you say truth, mm-hmm. what is the unadulterated truth of what happened with Tupac? Um, per your investigative, you got sure. to see everything that the law enforcement seen and 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 then some probably and talking sure. to people. What is the the truth? Tupac was a loyal person, and he, he was if you had his back, I, I think um, he had your back. Mm-hmm. And I think that that unfortunately that loyalty is what led to him getting killed because he got involved in a gang beef that otherwise didn't have anything to do with him. Mm-hmm. But it did involve, you know, his new friends that he had made at death row mm-hmm. and these mob pyrus and, mm-hmm. and that he was around. And they had his back. And I think, I don't know what was going through his head that night in Las Vegas exactly, but I suspect, but, but Orlando Anderson, a uh, Southside Crip, mm-hmm. a known shooter, had suspected of committing other murders, um, was it described to me uh, as a, by another um, pyru as basically being crazy almost Mm -hmm. like he would shoot like the kind of guy that would shoot your house up for Mm -hmm. nothing like you know not that he did but like it was that kind of guy you didn't know what he was yeah loose cannon yeah Yeah. and you know uh 
like MC8 said in an interview, he said, you know, if you walk up and punch a guy, you don't know if he's killed nobody or if he's killed 20 people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think Tupac even knew who this guy was or what his background was. He just knew that he had a beef with Trayvon Lane, one of the Pyrus, and they had apparently made up their mind after this, this fight that had happened at a mall. Mm -hmm. The next time we see Orlando Anderson, it's on. Mm -hmm. and me, that next I'm sorry time not to cut you off. Yeah. Let me ask you this, because this was always disputed. So the fight at the mall mm -hmm. with Trayvon, and it was over the chain. Right. Did the chain get snatched or did it not get snatched? So the first thing I heard was that it got grabbed. Mm -hmm. And then I think what happened was it got grabbed in the scuffle and then Trayvon got it back. Okay. So it was, it's both. It was okay. taken from him, but then he was able to grab it back. Okay. And they also, um, I believe they tried to get, he had an MOB ring. Okay. And they tried to get that and they, they couldn't get that off of me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because I know it was kind of some discrepancies with that. Because mm -hmm. I think I remember uh, Reggie Wright kind of disputing that. You right. You know what I mean? Saying that, no, nobody got the chain snatched. Right. So I guess in essence, it, he it's, was right. Both are true. Yeah. In a way. Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> right. And that's what led to the confusion, I think. Okay. Okay. So Vegas, he, 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 Pac steps into a, a gang beef that has nothing to do with him. Yeah. And, you know, I think Trayvon got unfairly. Um, you know, kind of painted. Yeah, for kind that. of villainized. So, like they, they've made it out that like Trayvon like whispered in his ear like to go mm -hmm. fight that guy for him. Mm -hmm. That obviously that is not how Trayvon or any of those guys right. acted. They're not going to tell an artist mm -hmm. to go do a fight for go fight somebody for them. Right. I think what happened was um, they all the the gangsters notice Orlando Anderson standing there and they get together like there he is right there mm -hmm. and and Tupac's like. Who are you looking at? Mm -hmm. And that's when Trayvon was like, that's that's Orlando. That's the mm -hmm. guy we've been talking about. And not knowing Tupac's going to spin and right. go after the guy. And they're like, oh, we right. got to like, catch up with him. Mm -hmm. And Tupac just took it upon himself. And I think he said something like, you know, you're from the South or whatever. There's yeah. a reference to South Side and, okay. and punched him. Wow. And sealed his fate right there. Okay. Yeah. So... We we are we all know the whole world saw the video. You yep. know they stomp him out, whatever the case may be. Uh, Tupac and and you know and the entourage they leave, and so then there's a lot that goes on in between that. Right. So what what happens after that? The scuffle. So we have several informants and we have uh, witnesses who um uh, were let me there. Clarify when you say sure. informants, you yeah. mean. Death row informants. We have a, an informant who was there that night. Who I don't and I, I don't think I even know the person's name. They're kind of coded in the yeah. in the thing. But there and there was an informant who was there because there was a there was a group of not death row but on the mm -hmm. Crip side. Okay, you had Crips together and you have some New Yorkers together because you have Zip Martin is also right. there and he's got some New Yorkers with him. Okay, so you have a mix of Compton Crips and New Yorkers with Zip who are all right. together. Right, right. And so somebody who was in that mix, mm -hmm. you know, said that they overheard Zip say, you know, we have artillery out here. Mm -hmm. I mean, I got a gun if you need it, if right. you need to get one. And um, Corey Edwards, who was, um, he always denied, I think, that he was a Southside Crip, but he was at least friends with all of them. Mm -hmm. He's the one that claimed that, you know, he was at a bar with Orlando immediately after the fight, and Orlando's all beat up. And in his original statement back in the 90s, he said, oh, you know, Orlando wasn't that mad and whatever. Mm -hmm. And people have always took that to be an alibi that Corey was with Orlando at the bar when mm -hmm. the shooting happened. But if you read the rest of his statement, or Corey then says he left the bar. He left Orlando sitting there and went to the lobby and had an argument with his girlfriend and then went up to the room and was up the room for a while. And by the time he came back down, Orlando was gone and people told him Tupac had just been shot. Mm -hmm. So that he wasn't an alibi. Mm -hmm. Then Mur Murder Rap comes out and Keefe tells his story and Corey then gets interviewed by, I think, Crump, mm -hmm. Ben Crump for one of the I think A&E maybe. Mm -hmm. And then he, he kind of came clean because Keefe had said in his, in his thing that, yeah, Corey went with us mm -hmm. to 662 when we were trying to look for him. And then eventually we ditched Corey and some of the guys and went off on our own. But he went, he went with us initially. Corey then confirmed that to Crump that, yeah. And he says, in reality, Orlando Anderson was super mad, obviously. Yeah. And Corey is trying to talk him into, hey, man, you know, we're here to party. <laughs> like, yeah. it's fight night in Vegas. Like, let's just, let's, and, you know, let's deal with it when we get home. And he says, Orlando Anderson said, you know, if it was you, would you wait? Mm -hmm. And Corey was like, well. So they go to 662 and mm -hmm. Mob James, Big J, sees them outside. Right. He says he sees the Crips out in the parking lot. And I believe by this point they had heard that there'd been a fight. Mm -hmm. So they knew that something was up. But And I asked him, I said, Were, weren't you guys expecting retaliation for what had happened? And he said, yeah, but uh, not a shooting. Mm -hmm. It was disproportionate to... What had happened? He said we thought there'd be a fight at the club that night. Right. So everybody was kind of on alert for that. So when we saw the Crips and he saw the Crips and the parking lot. There it is. Like right. there's going to be a scuffle. You right. You know what I mean? So. 
I don't know how they could think <laughs> that though. You know what I mean? Given given Orlando's <laughs> reputation, yeah. Given Orlando's well, also just the air in mid nineties. Yes, that's Gang what I'm saying. All time high. Yeah, you know. Maybe they thought yeah. we're partying in Vegas. They probably thought that maybe you know? they didn't have nothing because they're out the hood. Right. Maybe just thought that okay, they ain't got no gun. And even Keefe said they just went out there to party. Mm-hmm. They didn't bring. They didn't. They didn't have a gun. They had to get. Right. You know, according to him, they had to get it from Zip. So okay. that would have been a correct assumption. They were just out there to have a good time, like mm-hmm. everybody else was. So right. Right. So they go up to six six two. Which who's in the car? It's it's Orlando, um, Keefe, mm-hmm. and then the other who are the other two. So when they go to six six two, you in the white Cadillac, you have Ter- Terry Brown, mm-hmm. uh, Terrence Brown, T Brown, uh, in the f- driving. You have Orlando Anderson, and you have DeAndre Smith, mm-hmm. uh, Big Dre, and then and Keefe's in a van with some other guys. Mm-hmm. And then they finally start realizing they're drawing attention, and plus police are there directing traffic and handling, you know, crowd control. Mm-hmm. So they're like, this is not a good place for us to be, so they leave. Mm-hmm. And they go up to a bar, uh, a uh, liquor store up the block. And that's where the, most of the crew is like, look, man, like, we don't really, we're not here for this. We got girls mm-hmm. and, you know, whatever else back in the hotel. Like, let's go, we're here to party. Like, we don't really want to do this. And supposedly Corey was kind of freaking out. Like, they're, you know, they're going to kill us. Mm-hmm. Like, let's, like, what are we doing? And so that's when Keefe ditched those guys and climbed in the Cadillac mm-hmm. with the other three guys. And they were like, we'll go off on our own. Okay. And that's when they ran into Shug and. So when they, Antoine. so it was just by chance. Yep. So when, when Keefe and them left 662, they were like, okay, fuck it. Let's go about our night. Yeah. And they, it's just fate. The they start. Song. They start driving. They're driving back to the strip, mm-hmm. and they just happen to catch Shug and Tupac and their whole car, you know, entourage mm-hmm. coming off the strip. Mm-hmm. And they're like, there they go right there. And girls are shouting their name, mm-hmm. and you know, everybody. They're making a big, you know, they're making a lot of noise and mm-hmm. you know, drawing attention to themselves. And there they are. And mm-hmm. They flipped an illegal U-turn and caught up with them at the next light. Wow, and and it was Orlando uh, ultimately in the back seat. Right. leaned over whoever was in the... He was... Uh, Orlando was sitting in on Keefe's side, so on the passenger mm-hmm. side. DeAndre Smith was on the driver's side. So mm-hmm. they pull up. DeAndre Smith's in the best position. Mm-hmm. And Keefe claimed that he went... He handed a gun to DeAndre, and DeAndre was like, mm-hmm. I came along for the... Kind of, I came along for the ride, but I'm not going to yeah. pull the trigger kind of thing. Right. And Orlando was like, you know, I'll do it. Give it yeah. to me. And he reached over DeAndre and... Wow. Did the shooting, yeah. So Orlando shoots, dude. Okay, he shoots Tupac. Mm-hmm. Um, at that point, did they even know that, did they say, or is there information that, that they know that they hit him at that, at that time that they know that, okay, we got him. I don't think they knew. No, mm-hmm. Keefe, um, Keefe saw Suge kind of ducking down mm-hmm. and, um, and saw, kind of saw the shooting happen, but I don't think they hadn't, they knew what damage they did. Mm-hmm. And if you look, I mean, the damage is, they sprayed the whole side of the car. I mean, right. Bullets going into the back seat, mm-hmm. you know, the back door, there's bullets in the windshield. Mm-hmm. Like it's like a seven foot bullet spread, you know, right. bullets rounds went into the parking lot across the street. Mm-hmm. So it's just a hail of bullets. And so I don't think they knew initially Mm-hmm. Until then, you know, the reports come out that he's in the hospital. So, but, you know, I seen Keefe D said that Suge always knew who it was because he said that they made eye contact. And yep. Keefe and Suge grew up together. Right. They played uh, football together as right. kids. Right. Suge, uh, Suge, I think, was an offensive lineman. And I think Keefe was the running back mm-hmm. on the same football team. Keefe used to go to Suge's parents' house and for barbecues. Right. Team parties and stuff. Like, yeah, they knew each other for right. sure. Yeah. Right. So Suge never divulged. He never told law enforcement anything. Nope. And he knew who, exactly who it was. That's according to Keefe, he absolutely knew. And I've also heard that um, Heron, who was one of the pirates, right? He was. I heard that he was um, the first person to go back from the week, and he went back the next day. Mm-hmm. He got back to Compton, and the first people that the inner circle, the pirates, and everything heard who did it from was him. And he said it was the Crips. Mm-hmm. You know, he said it was Southside. I don't think he specifically said Orlando, but mm-hmm. Southside did it. Mm-hmm. And that's how it. I mean, so it was within twelve hours of it mm-hmm. happening. People in Compton started hearing about this. Wow. And so once that happened, violence starts erupting in Compton. Right. Instantly. Yeah. So how many people got hit in Compton? Who got hit? Um, none of none of the people involved in the actual murder mm-hmm. <laughs> got right. hit. Uh, I know that there was a shooting. Um, one of the other shot callers of one of the other Southside Crip sets was hit. Uh, he, he survived. And um, another guy who... Um, was not even uh, affiliated, mm-hmm. but lived, I think, next door to Corey Edwards, mm-hmm. was shot in his front yard. And it, it's it's theorized that that might have been mistaken identity, that mm-hmm. they might have been going after Corey. Mm-hmm. And this guy 
got hit instead. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was more, and then, you know, Compton p- p- police is hearing from all their informants. Mm-hmm. The Crips are openly bragging. Mm-hmm. Orlando Anderson is openly bragging about this. Wow. The whole neighborhood knows that they did this. Wow. And so they, and now they know the gang war is happening and it's mm-hmm. coming. And that's when they said, we're going to do raid like 30 houses mm-hmm. and make arrests if we need to, but we got to shut this down yeah. before it gets any worse. Right. You know, but also it's people ask, well, why didn't, you know, the Pyrus get revenge? Mm. Look, the, the Crips are not stupid. Gang members are not stupid in this situation. They're going to lay low. Right. They're not going to they're not going to be sitting in front of their house waiting for someone to drive by. Yeah. Nah. So and they know anybody, any car that comes up and down the street yeah. that's driving slow and it's got the windows down. Yeah. You know, it's not as easy to do as maybe people on the outside think it would be. Yeah. Yeah. So let me. So being that all of this is pretty much common sense, we know how to if you from the streets, you know how they work. Law enforcement knew this. Where do you think the all the conspiracy theories, I mean, started? Like, how can you even make sense of that for the conspiracy of, oh, Suge had it done. Oh, Suge sacrificed him and, all, you know, all the crazy shit. Right. Where do you think that came from? Or is that just the people and the public just sensationalizing it? Where did that come from? I know um, Russell Poole, I know, theorized that mm-hmm. Suge had set it up. Mm-hmm. So I think he may have been one of the originators of that theory that mm-hmm. it was, uh, which is so silly to have, to Suge would sit in the car next to yeah, the guy and be the backstop for all the bullets. I mean, he came <laughs> that close, inches away from being killed yeah. himself. Yeah. In fact, I think one of the shows, like A&E or somebody, they recreated it with like a yeah. sharpshooter yeah. and dummies. And he instantly killed the Suge dummy. Like it was, yeah. there was, it was pure luck that right. he didn't get hit. Right. Well, he got grazed in the yeah, head. He and he did. He yeah. got, they yeah. don't, and they don't know if he got hit with a bullet or like yeah. a, a Part fragment. of a jacket or a yeah. fragment or, or a mm-hmm. piece of glass or what. But, yeah, he was hit in the head and wounded. Mm-hmm. In fact, Sh- Tupac initially after the shooting was worried about Suge. Right, right. Because he's got that. blood point out of mm-hmm. his head, you know. Yeah, mm-hmm. Don't worry about me. Like, you're the one that's head bleeding. Wow. Yeah. So so the conspiracies were just, so it started with kind of Russell, Russell Poole and just people's just being, I guess, enamored yeah. with, you know what I mean, the whole incident and just something to talk about. Uh, I mean, I think it's human nature to not accept the the easy official story, right? right. It's, uh, it's got to be something deeper, mm-hmm. you know, and then the stuff starts coming out about Tupac was going to leave the label. Mm-hmm. But that was all, that was sanctioned. Suge knew that. And, and from what I've heard, Suge wanted people, wanted his artists to grow mm-hmm. and branch out. And still, you know, Death Row would be the central hub to this expanding kingdom, you know. And if you look, you can actually see um, where Tupac's, his company was actually registered. And you can still look up mm-hmm. the company registration records. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the address for it is like a few blocks away from Death Row's offices. It was euthanasia. So he wasn't right? running away. Euthanasia. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. If you look at where it was registered, it's just a few blocks away from where. Yeah. So it, that's not someone who's like leaving that all behind and running Right. Out. Right. He's just, you know. Right. So he's fulfilled his contract, and now he's going to branch out and do bigger things. Mm-hmm. So Tupac dies. I think when was it? September. September. September ninety six. Yeah. Okay. September ninety six. So, what? Within a year or six to eight months? About six months. Biggie gets killed. Right. Yeah. Right. March of ninety seven. Okay. Did Orlando get killed before or after Biggie? He, Orlando was still alive. Okay. Orlando was killed about a year and a half after Tupac's okay. murder. Right. Right. So about six months later, uh, Biggie gets killed. Right. Right. And so we pre- we know Orlando killed Pac. Okay. So Biggie. So I'm, and this is a question I'm asking. Sure. So how did, because I, I, because I know some of the inner workings. How did Puffy come to conveniently, you know, be associated with Southside? I mean, he's from New York and. You know, how is it out of all the sets mm-hmm. in L.A., you just conveniently right. become associated and affiliated with, you know, Suge's primary rival's right. neighborhood? Like, was that on purpose or just by chance? It was by chance, and uh, supposedly, uh, allegedly, it was through Zip Martin. Okay. Zip Martin already had a, bi- a business relationship with the Southside Crips. Mm-hmm. And the, the back at that time, uh, cocaine especially, mm-hmm. from West Coast to the East Coast, you could double your money of course. on a kilo. Mm-hmm. You could buy it here for like twelve or 13000 and sell mm-hmm. it over in New York for twenty five. Right. So that's what was happening. Okay. And so I, I, I believe what it was was Zip was involved in a, a, you know, a East Coast, West Coast drug trafficking ah. situation with the Crips. And that's where I think it became, well, I just happen to know... Mm-hmm. guys out there because i think kind of what happened was suge in, in essence kind of pulled bad boy's card for the mm-hmm. west coast after mm-hmm. tupac got killed mm-hmm. you can't come out here anymore right and right. or even before that um back when jake robles was murdered mm-hmm. that started up and so you can't run a, a hip-hop label and not be able to come to la right right well you know so he had to be able to find a way to come out here and so i think that's 
So Puffy elected to, you know, let's align ourselves with these street guys, you know, uh, with Zip. And then through Zip came Keefe. Yeah, Zip and Keefe were the ones that had the relationship. And Keefe claims that Zip would just kind of roll into the neighborhood and say, hey, come on, we're going to the mm-hmm. Anaheim or San Diego or wherever. Mm-hmm. And Keefe would round up 30 guys and they'd all get tickets. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it was a nice perk for all of them and they'd go down there. And the point of that was supposedly was that you, you have uh, your professional security you could have, you know, the best Navy SEALs in the world. Mm-hmm. They're not going to recognize a gang member from Compton. Right. They're not from the neighborhood. Right. So I think the idea was to have this extra layer of mm-hmm. guys there, what what Reggie Wright called homeboy security, mm-hmm. that can say, keep an eye on those 10 guys in the crowd. Mm-hmm. Those guys are not here mm-hmm. for good intentions. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, okay, so now with the Biggie thing. So, okay. So Biggie was being investigated at the time right. by the NYPD and the IRS. Correct. Why? So I, as far as I can, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons it could have been, uh-huh. but there, there was an NYPD detective with their major crimes unit who had him under surveillance in L.A. in mm-hmm. the days leading up to the murder. Right. And his, um, he claimed that it was based on a raid that had happened at Biggie's home, mm-hmm. that it started with a parking violation and blew up into a drug raid because the cop that knocked on his door to say, you got to move these vehicles, smelled marijuana smoke. And that led to a raid on his house. And they found guns and marijuana and that. And this detective from New York claimed that that sounds like a small thing. But in his experience in law enforcement, sometimes little things like that are the tip of the iceberg. And he says if you kind of start pulling that thread, sometimes you find out there's something bigger going on. That's bullshit. Yeah, and so, that's, so that was his ex- that was his <laughs> excuse. Bullshit. Yeah, that's bullshit <laughs> yeah, yeah. because that sounds like some hip hop police shit. Because, that's basically what it was. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. It doesn't make sense. I think he was like one of those original that, uh, yeah. William Oldham. I think he was one of those original you know hip hop cops. Yeah, and who guys, and who right. approved the man hours for him to do right. that? So we find some, <laughs> some you know personal use marijuana in New and, York. And we're going to, you know, okay the budget right. to pay you to follow him to and L.A. And Bad Boy sense. wasn't doing anything out here. They were yeah. just promoting and going to parties mm-hmm. and recording videos and going on the radio. Like, they weren't. Mm-hmm. These guys are watching them do nothing yeah. illegal, basically. So, that, right, yeah. right. It was a total waste. I and think. It's, yeah. it's such a, I mean, you know, I hate to say it. Well, I don't hate to say it, but it <laughs> is. It's, it's, a, it's a racial component there, too. Because sure. my thing is, you know, they work, in essence, for Arista. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, you know, they're being funded by Arista. So if there's if you're going to investigate something, you know, go to the office of Arista and, and say, hey, what, are y'all paying these people? You know, how are they right. doing what they're doing or whatever the case may be? Sure. You know, so that in itself is bullshit. But, mm-hmm. you know, I digressed a bit. But um, so but long that, story short, they were out here, yeah. whether it was for legitimate reasons yeah. or not. Yeah. They had them under surveillance. Okay. Uh, they had them under surveillance the night before the murder outside mm-hmm. the Soul Train Awards. Mm-hmm. In fact, this detective posed as a photographer mm-hmm. and got on the, the red carpet. Mm-hmm. Uh, there at the event, <laughs> actually, yeah, it's crazy, right? Really? Yep. That's crazy. Over some weed. That's crazy. Over Even weed. personal. That's <laughs> okay. And I don't. What was he gonna? F- I don't. What is he gonna see at a? At a I don't know what he thought he was going to see in a red carpet. At a red carpet. At a step, at a step so you can right. see some like illegal activity happen in front of all the camera. I don't understand. Yeah, like, that what, doesn't make sense. I, it may have just, although I guess in his perspective, it may have been, let's see who their associates are. Okay. That's usually what it's about. It's let's see who who are they yeah. meeting up with. Yeah. That's how they try to create they, conspiracies. Exactly. But even on the step and repeat, right. you're not going to get like crime associates. <laughs> right. Exactly. You're going to get whatever celebrities. Exactly. You know what I mean? right. Yeah. That's right, right, crazy. Right, right. Yeah. So you had all of this surveillance out there. So we have you have LAPD, you have Biggie Security, and we mm-hmm. have the IRS and the NYPD all out in this general area. Yeah, you have and you have um, you have Inglewood PD mm-hmm. uh, officers like Reggie Blaylock mm-hmm. who are working security as part of Big Security. He's mm-hmm. just hired you know hired mm-hmm. gun for the for the night, mm-hmm. and he ends up being a witness to the murder the next night. So you have a mix of Inglewood police officers. You have LAPD showing up to talk to the NYPD guys like, "What are you doing here? You know, we didn't know you had an operation going on." Mm-hmm. And you got NYPD and you got IRS federal right. agents. So yeah, right. And Puffy and Biggie, they were none the wise. The, the 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 team was none. The, Bad Boy was none well, the wiser. Well, to... what happened was, um, so a gang detective from South Division in L.A. Mm-hmm. finds out that this there's a surveillance operation going mm-hmm. on because another sergeant who's working the event has seen has been contacted by this guy. Mm-hmm. So he decides I'm going to call this gang detective. Like, what are these guys doing here? That guy says, I don't know. I'm going to go down and talk to him. So he rolls up and finds the guys doing the surveillance from New York, mm-hmm. and he 
sees who they're taking pictures of and he sees Puff and big security team hanging out by the vehicles waiting mm-hmm. for them to come out. Mm-hmm. And he recognizes Reggie Blaylock, the Inglewood police officer. Mm-hmm. And that's when he makes a decision. If you guys are maybe about to make an arrest or do make some kind of move, I need to warn that police officer because mm-hmm. they're in plain clothes. You guys are in plain clothes. Guns, I, I can tell they're armed. I can see bulges in their jackets. Mm-hmm. This could turn into a, if they don't know who you are and you don't right. know who they are, right. this could turn into a catastrophe. Yeah. yeah. Um, kind of like what happened with Frank Liga and Kevin Gaines, basically, mm-hmm. not even recognizing that they're cops. Right. So he went over and, and warned them. And I don't know if him warning them led to Puff knowing about this or if mm-hmm. they already knew, but supposedly uh, Puffy came out and when he, he looked across the street or looked over at the, the, Agents from F from New York and waved, and oh, they wow. went back, and that was that okay. Was it. Okay, wow. <laughs> so that's like kind of a, like a baller move, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, kind of yeah. like he's hey. kind of flexing on them a exactly. little. Exactly, that's yeah. what it seems like. Yeah. yeah, that's my interpretation. Yeah. So, so what happened? So now, okay, they're leaving. So walk me through that. What the what the report says? I mean that. What happened? So that that night ends. You know, everybody goes their separate ways. Um, I think Big goes back to his hotel, Puff goes to Fat Burger, <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's just kind of the end of the night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the NYPD wraps up their, well, at least the, the main detective, he has to fly home the next day because mm-hmm. he has to testify at a case in Brooklyn. And so he says he left a couple guys behind, but he's adamant that nobody was at the party the next night, mm-hmm. um, which is possible because I don't think that was really a planned thing. I think that was kind of a last-minute day of decision for mm-hmm for bad boy to go to the Peterson party. So, uh, he's, he's adamant that they were not there that night and nobody witnessed, you know, the, the murder when it happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next night, um, they kind of bounce around from a couple parties and they end up at the Peterson and they roll into the Peterson and they're there for like, I think a couple hours. And then, um, more, the Peterson party, way more people showed up than they were prepared for. Mm-hmm. And I think the event organizers didn't really have enough security to handle everybody. Mm-hmm. And they're having to turn people away at the door and people not getting in are starting to get mad. Mm-hmm. And you, you, you have some active gang members who are there and it's just getting to be a bad scene. So eventually around like midnight or so, uh, the Peterson requests to have like, we gotta, you gotta get all these people out of here. Mm-hmm. And fire department rolls in and shuts it down for, you know, being over capacity or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so the party gets shut down. It takes about half an hour or so from then before they actually are in their cars and leaving Mm -hmm. because they got to get out and then they're hanging out in the garage area on the first floor just outside the doors waiting for their vehicles to be brought around and you know they're taking pictures with fans they're talking to girls you know puff supposedly inviting girls to their you know Mm -hmm. they come to our next party with us whatever and uh while this is happening uh their security team are noticing a couple of individuals that are suspicious to them striped shirt there's a guy in a striped shirt yeah. is one of them um, who is seen kind of mad dogging them. Mm-hmm. And uh, he at one point kind of purposefully walks right through their group kind of mm-hmm. as a, you know. Yeah, antagonizing. F- yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then Eugene Deal also spots this guy, and this is the famous spotting, mm-hmm. of a guy in a blue suit in a bow tie who kind of starts walking toward him and Puffy's vehicle, and he's got a handkerchief in his hand. Mm-hmm. And G- Deal, I think, kind of flashes his piece at the guy, and the mm-hmm. guy turns around and, and walks away. Mm-hmm. And so... That has always been the focus of, was that the shooter? Right. Um, but the description doesn't match. His suit color doesn't match what Biggie's driver said he saw. Mm-hmm. So there's some discrepancy. So we don't know if that was the shooter or not, mm-hmm. or if it was someone connected to the shooter, mm-hmm. or if it was just completely random. Mm-hmm. But Nation of Islam were there doing security that night. They'd been at the Soul Train Awards the night before. Mm-hmm. There was a, the hotel in La Cienega that's now the SLS. Mm-hmm. It used to be called the Nico. Right, and so their security team there had hired guys, and some of them ended up were were in OI, who to work to with the celebrities that were staying at their hotel. Mm-hmm. That it was like a perk, I guess, to offer the celebrities some private security to go with them. So there were in OI guys there that we know were dressed in this same attire. Okay. So did he see one of them? Was it a random person, or was it someone tied to the shooting? Was it the shooter, mm-hmm. or was it somebody conspiring with the shooter? That is, none of that has ever been, mm-hmm. you know, proven. On the next episode of the Holding Court podcast, right? They're in Death Row's backyard, yeah, partying six months after Tupac is killed, and they they think they won. And not Tupac's only that, dead, Shug's in prison. And not only that, you're in Los Angeles, yeah. So right. you know, people, he could have just been somebody that's just from L.A. Sure. Like, hey, right? You know, y'all the ops, y'all right. should be out here, right? You know, absolutely. So.